uh, economic growth, uh, you can see, as we've been talking about a lot in the media, I will go through this very quickly. I don't want to do a, most of you sort of understand these kind of figures. With the high school, we, of course, we've been taking it too slowly. There's a lot more awareness. Seven years of consecutive growth, uh, which is only the second time since the independence that we've had seven years of consecutive growth. These, uh, uh, despite Winston, we still grew or expect to grow by 2%. Um, we, of course, had a downward trend here uh, on the MIG. Um, the RBF is just a couple of days ago revised a upward uh, growth figure of 3.6 uh, into 2017, which is, of course, also, sorry, 3.8, it was 3.6, it's now 3.8. It was used to looking the old year. But projected growth is, of course, 3% and 2.9% uh, going into the next uh, couple of years, 2018, 2019. What are the areas that are actually contributing to the growth? Um, these, again, have been revised. Agriculture is about 0 0.34. Fisheries and forestry are, path are performing very pathetically in respect of their contribution. That obviously, it means there's a lot more potential there for those two sectors to contribute and we need to look at very closely what we are doing uh, both as government and also as the private sector as to what we can do in those two sectors. Manufacturing has increased to 0 0.61. Um, we actually now manufacture quite a lot of things in Fiji and manufacturing has grown in that respect. Uh, sugar production is also included here uh, but it's predominantly in the other areas and new areas of manufacture that has grown significantly. Construction of has it again? Uh, collection. New job advertisements went up by 15.1 percent. Personal remittances, rugby players, security forces, uh, security guards, nurses, caregivers, friends and family and relatives sending money back home went up by 5 percent. This is our second largest foreign exchange earner, personal remittances. New consumption lending went up by 7.9 percent. Uh, we've seen, of course, you'll see uh, the, uh, the, the collection in VAT, of course, uh, has meant there's a lot more consumption uh, by people because of the lower VAT rates and low interest rates. A lot of confidence we see. This is just uh, in the private sector. This is again the vehicle registration, just to highlight it. The dark represents, sorry, the light represents the second end vehicles. Just by comparison, 2005, there were 6,088 second end vehicles registered. By comparison, it's 10,152. 3,363 in 2005, now there's nearly 5,000. That's of course growing. You can see there's an increase here. Of course, we reduced the duty on hybrid cars, completely zero rated. Now that we find a lot more sort of nuanced approach to uh, uh, duty on motor vehicles, not all hybrid cars, except the, sort of the top, second, and third uh, levels actually do get full duty free. Nonetheless, the duty on the hybrid cars are overall very low. Of course, we've reduced the duty overall on new vehicles, any in vehicle with the Engine size of 2,500 cc got a uh, duty reduction. Uh, those above that uh, did not, and they also had to pay an additional sum. So if you buy a 3,000 uh, cc BMW, uh, we will not just pay the duty in the excise, but also you pay $20,000 on top of that. If you're rich, you can afford it. We use that money to pay for free education. Uh, retail sales survey, um, as you can see, generally, uh, uh, has been increasing, average growth rate of 7.1% um, as far as uh, retail sales are concerned. Inflation, again, um, you know, we've at least for the past uh, three years or so has been below 2%. Uh, generally, you find this, uh, you know, highs because of cyclones. Uh, again, because of Winston, uh, those of you who live in Suva would know a bunch of bananas after Winston cost 20 bucks. It's now come down to about $5. Long beans used to cost. Uh, $5 a bundle, it's now down to about $2. Yongona is still $110 a kilo in the Western Division. It's about $40, but consumption rate, of course, still remains buoyant. Um, but that is coming down. We expect inflation rate to, of course, uh, come down even further in the short to medium term. That's going down. It was as high as more than 5%, actually, over 6%. Over here, you can see it's come down to about 4.1%. Now, this is the reason I talked about consumption. Um, the international benchmark is that it should have at least four months worth of foreign reserves to be able to trade uh, in, you know, with your foreign partners and traders. Um, we have an all-time high of our foreign reserves. It's never been as high as $2.1 billion. Today it is $2.1 billion. By comparison, again, 2005, 
this $549 million, 2.3 months worth of uh, uh, imports you could get from that, but now it's 5.8, sitting at $2.1 billion. Generally, a lot of people may not realize this, but uh, um, World Bank, uh, not World Bank, sorry, but international, multilateral development banks uh, look at this to see how healthy you are. Also, for example, organizations like Fiji Airways, when they go off and uh, get a loan from the European investment banks to buy the A330s, um, they look at this so they know your ability to repay the debt, and this has a favorable bearing on your interest rates uh, when you know entities such as Fiji Airways uh, do borrow offshore, and also, of course, governments too. Next, please. Fiscal deficit, as I've been saying, all governments in Fiji, right from Ratu Mara's government days, all throughout, have all been running fiscal deficits every single year, except probably about three times in our entire post-independent history. Uh, this is a surplus, probably because of an underspend uh, that we've had over there. Of course, the longer the line, the uh, worse of you are, the shorter the line, the better it is. Uh, but of course, it's also a question of balancing, because you do need to spend. We're a developing country. Uh, we are colonial, ex-colonial country, so as you know, with most colonial states, uh, most colonial powers never really invested in hardcore infrastructure. Uh, in Fiji, they didn't. You know, it's very interesting when you go down the western side, it's only the CSR compound areas that actually has the utilities. People living immediately outside the utility, those areas don't. Uh, so you need to be able to get access uh, to very basic infrastructure. It's a balancing act. Um, we have been you know, on target to sort of reduce the deficit. As you can see over there, we of course had the cyclone. We had another cyclone here. We had some major uh, infrastructure catch-up work to do. We again were trying to reduce it, but of course Winston hit us. Winston cost us approximately, unexpectedly, about $220 million direct spend in this year's budget. Uh, if Winston had not happened, uh, this line would have probably been sitting somewhere about there. So uh, that's the effect of a cyclone. Um, total revenue of government. Um, $1.1 billion, today we're sitting on $3.1 billion. So government revenue is almost tripled uh, since 2005, or 2004, I should say. Um, this, of course, is a good position to be in. We like to make some money uh, because we then, of course, can do a lot more with that money, but also have to, do not have to borrow as much. Uh, and this, is, of course, goes towards your debt that, sustainable position. Uh, and the idea, of course, is, uh, you know, to ensure that we have this revenue generation uh, without necessarily being a burden on the, on the consumer, but also not necessarily being a burden on the low-income earners. So uh, a true progressive taxation system is very important. So you want to go and eat at a fancy restaurant in Denarau, you'll pay the social responsibility, uh, uh, not social responsibility, you'll pay the environmental levy, and you'll pay the STT, and of course VAT. If you're going to eat at a takeaway place, uh, then you don't pay the SDT and the environmental levy. That's the point of distinction. So if you have the means to afford to go and eat at a fancy restaurant in Denra, you also have the means to be able to pay the SDT and the environmental levy. The same way, if you don't watch your DVD at home, but you want to go to the cinema, you'll pay those two additional taxes. What are the major areas that contribute towards our total revenue generation? Um, direct taxes, of course, corporate tax and income tax. I have to say this again. There's still a lot of people who don't pay enough taxes or pay the right amount of taxes. There's still a lot of pilfering going on here, and in particular here. Uh, we still have a lot of business houses that under-declare the value of goods that they're bringing in. The PECA does uh, has been actually made some strides with some companies recently, and you'd be sort of uh, flabbergasted at the level of nicking that goes, goes on, the level of under-declaration that goes on. We need to strengthen this. We've been saying this to FERCA. We believe FERCA can do a much better job here at the entry points in particular in customs. We still think that they are not necessarily doing 100% of what they should be doing. Um, again, this is, you know, uh, one of the effects of, of course, reducing uh, taxes is that you get greater compliance. It's not necessarily worth the while to have two books. Um, so people try and, of course, pay that to increase compliance in some sectors. 
Belier Tech too. We still have uh, some companies that do uh, do uh, some. Uh, what do they call uh, clever accounting in here too? Um, we still find that uh, they've you know, recently discovered quite a bit of that happening. Uh, but value added tax contributes 30 percent. The others, as you can see, are self-explanatory. The other uh, revenue sectors that contribute towards the overall 3.1 billion dollars that we collect is, is revenue. What we've done, uh, we've actually put infrastructure development, health, education, access to justice, and social protection together to show you the uh, amounts of money that are currently being spent as opposed to what was being spent before. Social protection is something about $30 million that we pay on an annual basis to single mothers, abandoned children, people living below the poverty line. We introduced, for example, there's still a many, many people in Fiji who do not actually have FNPF because they've lived as villagers, fishermen, farmers, etc., uh, who never worked for anybody, so they're never in the formal sector, so they don't actually have any pension security. Uh, we started off with a very modest sum, about $30 a month for those people over the age of 70. We then reduced the age to 66, and today we give them $50 a month um, by way of um, you know, some form of relief. We're surprised how many, uh, because in Fiji we have this general idea that uh, children look after parents, we'd be surprised how many of them don't anymore. Uh, so a lot of these people are actually abandoned and have to source income for themselves. Access to justice, legal aid. Um, in 2006, I can tell you, there's only three legal aid commission offices throughout Fiji. Today, we've seen like 14. We've got another three or four on, on the way. To every single major urban center in Fiji, including places like Nambawalu, Tabuni, Sabu, Tabua, Reki Reki, Kandavu, Ovalau, all of these places all have actually legal aid centers. We spend approximately about in excess of $5 million a year. A lot of women, for example, who don't get their maintenance paid, there's no lawyers charge a lot of money, they can't afford them, so legal aid gives them protection just because you are poor. And even if you've committed a criminal offense, it should not mean that they should not have legal representation. These people actually provide legal representation. They also now draft wills, because generally <coughs> drafting of wills was seen as a purview of only the right or only the rich people. Uh, they have also issues too. Uh, I may have a single house or just one car. I should be able to will that. So they help you draft those wills. A lot of people die interstate. In other words, without drafting a will, so they help them solve those problems. Education, uh, as you know, it's uh, one of the major spends now. The budget for education, of course, will need to increase in particular because of Pell's and Poppers, because the reality is that a lot more people now access education. Nearly every single child that finishes year 13 now goes to university or goes to technical college. And every single person, irrespective of where they come from, or ethnicity or religion, has the ability to access the tertiary education loan scheme. So we've seen now something like 16 or 17,000 people students who are in university who are being assisted through the TELS or the TOPUS program. You'd be surprised how many people have said to me, uh, for example, they said, we wish we had free education in high school, I would have finished high school. I used to come first all the time, but I had to leave because my father could not afford to pay for the fees of all our seven brothers and sisters. So only one or two went to school. Generally, we also have found that a lot more women are attending high schools now because generally when you could not afford fees, the girls stayed home because they didn't get married in any case, so the husbands would look after them. So they did not go to high school. It's a reality, particularly in the rural areas and low-income families. Uh, also, you know, of course, with university education too. Health, uh, yes, we've increased the budget, but um, we have a major problem with health, which is the inability to actually get the right number of doctors and the right number of specialists. It is, I think, a tragedy that in Fiji today, if any one of us has a heart attack now, there's no Fijian doctor that can carry out an open heart surgery. In the 21st century, it is actually quite pathetic that, I have to say this, governments in the past have not invested in the human resource capital. You cannot, for example, have a person who's done medicine to become a cardiac surgeon overnight. They need about 10, 15 years of exposure. They need to go overseas for training. They need to actually sit through surgeries to be able to leave the, achieve that level of specialization. So as you know, in the last budget, we announced that uh, doctors have received up to about 80% pay rise. Any doctor that joins the civil service now, um, as a graduate doctor, or any doctor that joins, they want to do any postgraduate studies, we pay for it entirely 100% for them to go to FNU and do part-time studies to 
achieve some level of specialization, but of course it needs a lot more specialization in terms of exposure. Minister of Health, as we speak, is down with the PS for civil aviation and, um, sorry, PS for civil service and the PS for health in India at the moment, trying to recruit doctors. We're recruiting doctors from other countries too, but they're going on a huge drive to recruit specialists. We had at one stage only one ear, nose and throat specialist in the entire country. Uh, we don't even have a speech therapist in Fiji. So if your child may have a little bit of speech impediment, which can be fixed up very easily at an early age, we don't have the ability to do that. So these are the areas that actually require specialization and we need to invest in our human capital that won't develop overnight. But in the meantime, we can hire people from overseas to fill in the gap. They can also train our local doctors too. Infrastructure development, as you know, we've put in a lot of money into roads, water, electricity, uh, jetties, etc. Expenditure mix. Uh, um, I mean, you all, most of you are business people, you understand. More money you spend in capital, the better it is for you, in particular when you're running a deficit. 2004, 83% of the entire budget the government spent went into operating expenditure. Only 17% went into capital. Today, we're looking at a mix of about 60, 40. As you know, this has been the target. We've been trying to lower our operating costs and increase the capital. Uh, not just uh, reducing the operating cost, but also trying to reduce as a, as a percentage of our total spend, uh, which is very, very critical. Of course, the, what I've explained to the high school students, the example that I do give them, I said, if you all decide to have a party at McDonald's and you don't have the money, and you go to Westpac or ANZ or whichever one of the banks, and the bank manager decides to lend you money, you have the party, you have the drinks and the burger, you wake up in the morning, the burger and the drinks are gone, but the debt is still there. You've got nothing to show for it. Um, but if you actually go and borrow money to build something, the debt will, uh, will go one day, but the asset will still be there. That's what we're trying to do. So when we do borrow money, we've got something to show for it. You'll see later on in the slide about our operating savings. Next, please. Uh, funding for roads and bridges, good old PWD days. We had about $55 million. I hear that some people want PWD back. But we've now got to spend about $527 million um, for roads, bridges, and jetties. Um, the, the, the trick question the, the trick question that I have for the students is I said you know you go and look at this four lane road outside Nandi airport I said apart from the four lane road what do you see that's different and the trick the answer of course is no you don't see FEA cables on top or nor do you see telecom lines on top it's all gone underground the traditional way of building roads in Fiji has been if, if you have this road here you put the water pipe underneath the road so when the water, water mains have a leak, you actually dig up the road to fix up the water pipe. But then you fix up the pipe, but you don't fix up the road. Or there's a leak and you don't know about it, but the whole the road starts getting potholes. And that's, in fact, one of the major problems in Suva. A lot of the water mains are actually not running on the side of the road, but it's running underneath the road. And a lot of these assets are, of course, aging. So when we do have this spend here, we have to, whenever we do major capital works, we have to build back better. And that's a lot of people don't realize that. You saw the huge uh, digging up of the roads in, uh, in uh, Blackstaff and all of that. FEA was actually replacing 40, 50 year old cables that needs to be fixed up now. And in fact, in Fiji, we're not very good at actually maintaining assets. We need to be able to set aside some money to maintain our assets. Again, water and energy, um, you can see the difference. We've given actually a lot of money this year in particular for water. A lot of people don't have uh, reticulated access to reticulated water systems. Um, you may have heard that the uh, Suva Nasori Corridor actually has about a $300 million spend over the next four years in terms of upgrading the sewage systems and the water systems. Sewage systems are way behind in the urban centers. A lot of the areas aren't actually connected to sewage systems. If you want to become a modern city, modern nation, you need to have sewage systems. Of course, it has an impact on your ability to build high-rise apartments or a lot more apartments uh, per square meter. We also, as part of this, as you know, I don't know how many of you are aware, but we give uh, free water uh, for those people who earn below $30,000 a year. Uh, World Health Organization says that you and I, as individual human beings, require 50 liters of water a day to bathe, to go to the toilet, to eat, to drink, to wash. And based on that, extrapolated over five people per family, um, 
uh, we give in excess of about 90,000 liters of free water a year. Electricity also, um, if you earn less than $30,000 a year, the unit cost of electricity for domestic users is about 34 cents. The old approach of the previous governments, of course, was that we need to keep the cost of electricity down, so everybody paid a flat rate, 24 cents or whatever it was. But of course it meant the person who had five air conditions and one swimming pool paid the same rate as the person who had one fridge and five light bulbs in their house. So we need to make a distinction. The way that the distinction is that FEA charges the right tariff rate and the person who can afford it, earns more than $30,000, pays the right tariff rate. The people who earn less than that, of course, will get the subsidy um, from government. So we pay 17 cents of a unit cost of electricity for those people who earn less than $30,000 a year. It's also applicable to those people who do the prepay. It's also debited to their account. Oh, sorry, the other thing about the electricity is also, uh, those of you who may know about, or who have families in the rural areas, that before, for example, if you had the grid coming up till here and there's about 20 homes further down the road, they had no electricity, you actually had to pay for connection fee. So maybe there are 20 homes and they say you have to all contribute X number of dollars. Maybe out of 20 homes, 10 people connected, 10 homes connected, the other 10 did not. So they never got connected until all 20 paid. A lot of the monies were actually sitting with government. So we returned all the money and we said we'll do it for, of course, free without a contribution. But of course, we have a long list of areas and homes that need to be connected. Funding for education, as I uh, said earlier on, uh, we expect this line actually to go much higher. To be frank, this coming budget and the budget after that. Because we have to go the full cycle. Because, of course, there are those people who started off on the maybe over here, it's, a, it's only the second year now. So they look probably another two years. And of course, in the meantime, we've got more people joining every year. So we probably need to go at least four or five years of increments until it will reach a stage where it will level off. We're seeing more and more demand for this now. <coughs> for example, there are courses available now. At the moment, TEL is only applicable for those people who finish year 13. But there are also courses available at FNU where, sorry, uh, courses available at FNU where you can do engineering courses only after completing year 12. Those people are saying, look, we want to get TELs also. There's an ever-increasing demand. There's also a shortage of um, people who study in the science area. That's why the proper scholarship is actually skewed towards science subjects. So we don't give scholarships for people to become lawyers. Uh, you can get TELs. Uh, so the top of the scholarship is only in, predominantly in the science areas. We do have, for example, some scholarships in accounting and economics, but predominantly doctors, nurses, um, land surveyors, town planners, environmental scientists, marine biologists, what have you, lab technicians, radiologists, we have a huge shortage of people in that area. Um, and that's what is skewed towards. Uh, health, again, like I said, you know, they're not necessarily remarkable figures. They have been an increase from 2013. Uh, if you compare that to 2017, it's significant. That it's about uh, um, 90 odd, or more than that, about nearly a hundred million dollars in increase, but still the main issue there is the, the, the human resources that we need to improve our health services uh, in, in Fiji. Of course, places like Nandi, Nandi was still being treated like a rural outpost. So the, you know, the, the classification of the hospital was, you know, a subdivisional hospital in that. But now, of course, Nandi is a, is a city. Uh, and will be declared officially that. So we need to be able to be cognizant of, of, of those uh, changes too. You'd be surprised when we bought the first MRI machine in Fiji about five or six years ago, it was the only one in the Pacific. At one stage we had more Pacific Islanders using it than locals because they're all coming to Fiji to use it. But the reality of course is that when we had when we had the MRI imaging, we did not have people who knew how to read MRI imaging. But all doctors can do that. So again, it's because of the skill sets that was absent. So you can have all the wonderful technology, but if you don't know how people who, who know how to use it, it's redundant. Our operating revenue, you can see, is, is uh, quite substantial. As I highlighted, it's nearly triple. Um, that's our operating expenditure, the brown pit, and this is the operating savings we are having compared to, say, 2004. 
uh, we've been increasing uh, and we of course hope to make this operating savings a lot more wider uh, and we're sharpening things. I mean, a lot of things that we are doing, for example, you know, we lease vehicles now as opposed to buying vehicles. So we are able to, and the police, for example, will be getting for another new 100 vehicles. Uh, if we were to buy all the vehicles, as was traditionally done the case, I mean, you know, we would not have been able to play the catch-up game. But also it does help new, uh, new car dealers because by buying new vehicles, you're also creating employment. You're getting after three or four years those new vehicles after three years out in the market. So it gives people who want to buy a second-hand car, um, new technology, a vehicle that has actually been maintained well. So it you know, creates that pool of vehicles that otherwise would not be in the system. And it also helps us to catch up with our vehicle uh, you know, requirements. Government debt, a lot of people talk about this without necessarily understanding it. As I say to the uh, students and the university students, this is, of course, the nominal figures here. The figure, the, the graph, part of the graph to watch is, of course, this line here, which is your debt to GDP ratio. So, the example that I've said, used with the, with the students that, you know, presuming that GDP is worth $100, we got and borrowed $20, the debt to GDP ratio is 20%. But assuming our GDP increases and we, it's $500, but we then go and borrow $50, which is double the amount that we borrowed, even though it's doubled or more than two and a half times, debt to GDP ratio is 10% as opposed to 20%. If you increase your wealth, essentially your GDP productivity, uh, then your ability to borrow is enhanced. But we have a, as government, we have a policy to try and reduce this line going down further. This glitch over here is because of the fact that we had to go out into the market and borrow because of Winston. If Winston had not happened, this line would have continued to go down. Oh, this is... Uh, done some comparisons of other countries. Debt to GDP ratio in Japan is 239.2%. Still rated AAA, by the way. Of course, it's, you know, it's one of those countries. USA, debt to GDP ratio 107.4. Comparable countries, I suppose, are Maldives, uh, Seychelles, Nauru, Mauritius, which everybody talks about. Mauritius is very interesting. You can see the debt to GDP ratio is relatively higher than compared to ours. But they made a very strategic decision a few years ago as we are doing, as we have recently done. And that is they decide to pump in a lot of money and go out and borrow very heavily and build into infrastructure. Because they saw themselves as the hub and a safe haven for the African continent. They're not that far away from Africa. Uh, it's safe. They've uh, really uh, beefed up their law and order. They've got four lanes road. They've got uh, an IT hub. They provide a lot of broadband capacity. So a lot of the international companies are now coming and setting up shop in Mauritius to service the African continent. A lot of rich South Africans are actually coming and buying apartments in Mauritius. Mauritius law pertaining to the ownership of property by foreigners is a lot more stringent than ours. Some people in Fiji made a bit of a hoo-ha. In fact, it's, it's nothing comparable to what they have done. But they still come. You can only buy strata title as we've said that you should do in Fiji if you live in the municipal areas. And those apartments actually, is very interesting, I've talked to some of the officials, um, up to 40% of the price of the apartment goes to government as tax. What you do get, or sorry, 50%, what you do get is that you get a permanent residency status. You don't become a citizen, it's very difficult to become a citizen, but you get a permanent residency status, you can come in and out of the country, but you have to actually buy a property uh, in the meantime. But they've invested very heavily. They've done a lot of public-private partnerships in hospitals. A lot of Africans now, instead of flying to India and various other places, simply fly across to Mauritius. So you have companies like Fortis and Apollo that have formed JVs and they've set up in Mauritius uh, to be able to uh, provide those sorts of services. Interestingly enough, Australia's got a debt to GDP ratio of 41.1 good thing with the huge windfall of the mineral resources they had, they would not be as high, but it is as high. Many would argue because of the, uh, a lot of the costs that are associated, uh, that are being given away, give, give away during election time, uh, which becomes recurring costs. Uh, and of course the others, as you can see, are self-explanatory. So in summary, um, the economy is accelerated 3.8% in 2017. 
uh, favorable growth prospects. We see a lot of private sector optimism in investment. A lot of it uh, lined up. A lot of it, of course, is because of the fact that we have a lot of incentives for people to invest, whether it's because of the duty reduction and things like prefab buildings and uh, those sorts of areas. Uh, prudent financial management, sustainable debt position, high capital expenditure versus operating savings, uh, we have a lot of operating savings, sorry, broad-based growth. Uh, this is very critical for us. We need to have broad-based growth. Uh, we want to really grow this because we don't want to be dependent simply in one or two areas. As we have said in the tourism sector, we still are too dependent on Australia and New Zealand for our rivals. 51% arrivals come from Australia, 16% comes from New Zealand, nearly 70%. Almost. If something happens to the economies, our tourism sector will suffer. Less people come in in McDonald's at, in Andy. So the idea is we want more Indians, we want more Chinese, we want more Europeans, we have more Middle Easterners to be able to mitigate those risks. So if we had arrivals from Australia 20% or 15% sitting, but we of course grow the numbers, um, if, for example, the arrivals decreases from those countries, we still are able to depend on the other source markets. Uh, foreign reserves are at a uh, record high. Inflation is set to stabilize between, uh, below 3% in the medium term. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's just the short presentation. Uh, we have a next slide for you, uh, which will show you the email address to which you can send your submissions. You may have some ideas of this which you may want to share with others and want to send it to us in private. You can do that. Alternatively, you may, uh, some ideas may percolate after you leave here. If you want to send that to us, please do so before next Friday.